So, with that, I want to introduce our amazing kickoff keynote speaker, a gentleman that I met in South Africa this last winter. I was totally blown away when I saw this guy. <laughs> he, came, he came to uh, STIAS, which is a research center I was working at there. And he brought these books, children's books, on sustainability. It's written, I think, 250 books, something like that. The Chinese government has bought them and is distributing to all the children in China. Uh, he's, he's learned, he's figured out how to make shoes out of thistles, insoles out of coffee, which are, you'll talk about all of this stuff. I don't want to take your talk away. But w one thing I noticed, and sort of a personal note, is that I was saying, who is this guy? And I'm looking on Google, right, and, I, and YouTube, and I see these amazing TED Talks, you know, and he seems very articulate and fluent. And, and then I noticed, oh, wait a minute, here's one in another language, it's Spanish, oh, yeah, English and Spanish. I keep looking and looking. The same talk in seven languages. So I'm going, who is this guy? Anyway, I'll let you introduce yourself, and this is Gunter Pauli. Please give him a big hand. Thank you very much. And, and yes, it was very nice to meet uh, the team there at uh, the university. Um, you know, the reason why I accepted to come here is a very personal reason, to be very honest. 41 years ago, I was an exchange student in Colorado. And I stayed with Frank and his wife, Maria, who's staying home with the dogs. And there is Frank. Frank, thank you. Um, and I actually looked at coming to study at, Bol at Boulder, so, but it didn't work. But anyway, um, my life has been determined by this animal. I created in 1991 the first zero emissions factory, a factory that had no waste, nothing in the air, nothing in the water, no solid waste. My factory was biodegradable, the factory. My staff was dressed in Patagonia underwear, and of course something over it, but my staff was dressed in Patagonia underwear so I could turn the thermostat in the factory down with six degrees. And I had calculated that it was cheaper to pay Patagonia underwear for everyone in the factory than to keep the thermostat up at a high level. This was my beginning of systems thinking. But I went to Indonesia because I became the largest buyer of palm oil in the world. And in Indonesia, I realized that that is the rainforest and that today, according to Unilever, is considered a sustainable palm oil plantation. I don't know if I can speak freely, but this to me is bullshit. I mean, how could you ever convince the public that that is sustainable and that is the forest? And of course, this is what we call an empty forest. An empty forest where nothing grows but the tree. Now, come on. I have been able in Colombia to regenerate 8,000 hectares of rainforest through a systems approach. And we know that we move from 14 species to 256 species, and that you have to regenerate biodiversity, and that this can never by any other mind than someone who has an MBA. Only those who have an MBA can call this sustainable. Because they only focus on cash, right? It's the only thing they're interested in. So what I realized is that I was there, but then you have an amazing choice to make. I am considered a guru, invited to the Rio conference, and I realize I'm not a guru. I realize I'm destroying the ecosystems. And then the question is, am I going to do less bad and look for a transition, or I'm just going to not do it anymore? And that is an ethical question. That's ethics. If ethics is not part of your systems analysis, you are not in systems. Ethics is at the core. And this is what we are saying then. Do I now consider I failed, like Jean-Paul Sartre would say? Or do I take the philosophy of Benjamin Franklin and say, I never fail. I only figured out what doesn't work. <laughs> and I think we have to have that very clear view that we realize it isn't working. So move on. 
Never make a discussion about failure, good or bad. Move on and know that in good Buddhist philosophy, you can always do better. We are stuck in this Christian divide of the good and the bad. I have 16 years of Jesuit education. I know how they divide between the good and the bad. So in 1994, I actually set out on this passionate route of going for zero emissions. I was invited by the Japanese government and the United Nations to work on the Kyoto Protocol out of Tokyo. And imagine how would a business model look like that had no waste, no emissions. I was totally against this cap and trade stupidity that they were concocting. And the Japanese government gave me the freedom to do it. I had 82 researchers at my disposal to imagine, to research, to study how could business models evolve in a highly competitive fashion according to a new definition, our definition of sustainability, which was boiled down to the basics. Sustainability is that you have the capacity to respond to the needs of everyone with what you have, period. The capacity to respond to the needs of everyone. Everyone means us and these 100 million species, not just the two three generations. What about the other 100 million species with which we share? And so based on that, I was able to convince in 1997, 2,600 corporations in Japan to follow the logic of zero emissions and zero waste. It was considered heresy everywhere else in the world. But in 1995, I was able to crystallize my ideas together with Fritz of Capra, and we wrote a book together, Steering Business Towards Sustainability. You don't know this book of Fritz of Capra, because the co-author was not known. But the key is, we were framing this into a thinking how do we succeed in transforming through changes in business models and shifts in technology how we can steer society towards sustainability. I'm very happy to share with you that according to the University of Pennsylvania, today we're amongst the top 10 think tanks in the world for innovative policies. And we're a non-organization. That means we're networked. We only networked, we don't have endowment funds, we don't have all of that. We're just focusing on getting things done. It is action research. Because on one hand, we have the think tank with about 3,000 people who continuously feed us with all the science that is required. And on the other hand, we have the do tank. Because we need people who do. Because if you don't do, what are you searching? And yes, it's true, the Huffington Post told their readers at one point that this young man, <clears throat> not so young anymore, I turned 60, so I'm in that phase of transition, right? That I am like the Steve Jobs of sustainability. Let me tell you that my friends in Latin America fiercely disagree with that. They call me the Che Guevara of sustainability. <laughs> I hope I don't die of pancreas cancer. I hope I don't die of a bullet in my head shot by the CIA. But. The reality is we have to innovate the business models. The most fundamental systemic change we're in need of is the business model. I have an MBA. I know how they brainwash you to think along certain logic. And every year we're crunching out a million other MBAs who are going to take care of society to make certain you are the most unsystemic society in the world. Focus on one thing only, cash flow. Nothing else. The only thing that counts is money. So let me just show, tell you how I convince my dear friends in the business world that they have to drop this obsession with core business based on core competence. I tell them the story of the panda. The panda is this beautiful plushy animal that is loved by everyone, but is endangered because people encroach on the habitat of the panda, and the panda doesn't have enough food anymore, and since it doesn't have the food, it is dying out, and it needs government protection. So the government protects the pandas and makes certain that there are zoos around the world who take couples of pandas so they can procreate in their artificial environments. And I'm asking the question, is this really the problem? What if the panda were to change its diet and not eat bamboo anymore? The panda would survive. It's exactly what happens with business. 
Businesses focuses on a niche and only does that niche. And as soon as that niche is in trouble, then they need government protection. And they have websites where they want to be loved by everyone because they want to be loved like plushy pandas. This is how business is behaving today. And then, of course, they need massive marketing and massive lobbying to secure that that little niche, which gives them their daily cash flow, their daily bamboo, is actually being preserved. I suggest to businesses that start behaving like cockroaches. <laughs> cockroaches work with what is available. <laughs> they will live where they can live. You kill all of them, there's another one popping out. The government mandates the killing, there's no problem, they will survive. They've survived for 100 million years, ladies and gentlemen, they will survive for another 100 million years. The panda, no. So business must shift its business model. And therefore, let me just take you for the next 25 minutes through the business models. What are the business models we have implemented? Because the key is the implementation. And here is the business model that I'm going to paraphrase the business model of free email. You know, you've, been fallen, you've fallen into this trap, right? You have free email, and what are you willing to do? Give everything about you so they can sell it to anyone. It's an amazing deal, right? You think it's email for free, and they make billions on it. Fair enough. The deal is done, you signed the contract. So, we're designing a new business model around diapers. You know the diaper? I hope all of you is not using any of that. But uh, the diapers is a modern product that is one of the main reasons of unsustainability. It is 4 to 5% of any landfill of any city. It is killing fish massively in rivers because one of these acrylic beads that gets into the water expands 500 times in size and will kill off the fish. Slowly, steadily, but surely. So we have said, we're going to give you diapers for free, as many as you want. Just like you're getting your email for free. There's something in return. Yes, when you're getting your diapers free, you deliver the soiled ones back in a bucket. And with those soiled ones, we're doing what diapers should be done. That's the way they look like. Mm -hmm. Yes. And from this, we make black earth. Terra preta. Who knows terra preta? We make a black earth, and the difference with compost is that black earth has a 30-35% concentration of carbon. Carbon we need to fix. Carbon needs to get back in the soil. We've been harvesting, mining carbon from our soils. And if we don't have massive strategies to put carbon back in there, we are not going to have food in this world. Scrap the CO2 worry. Worry about the soil. Worry about the carbon in the soil. And how was it in the old times? Well, through excrements and through charcoal, biochar. Biomass, excrements, and biochar together were delivering that. So what are we doing? When you have now a baby, and you exchange the diapers, and you turn it into charcoal with biomass, with the baby's excrements, you will have a ton of terra preta per year. That's 350 kilograms of carbon sunk into terra preta for one baby. One baby! One! Can we calculate together? We take that terra preta, and it's so rich that with one kilogram, you can give enough nutrition to a fruit tree. We're massively planting fruit trees. We're not in the diaper business. We're in the fruit tree business. So we're planting fruit trees. And a one baby is a 1,000 fruit trees. Can we calculate together the impact on the community? We're redesigning cities today. We're working with Paris, Copenhagen, Berlin, Gothenburg, Oslo, and we're looking at how can we get the diaper, and I'm not going to go into the details of the design of the diaper because that would take us too far. But we're having this diaper, and we're redesigning the city. Why? Because if only a thousand babies have their pee and poo and the rest converted to the black earth, then in 25 years you will have 25 million trees. Only a thousand babies. How many babies are there in Boulder? More than a thousand, right? I drive from Littleton here, and I see these empty spaces that would be wonderful if they're covered with fruit trees. 
We can do that with the bee in the pool with the babies. But 25 million trees in 25 years, only of these 1,000 babies will give us 1.25 million tons of fruits for free. This is the abundance that nature will generate if we're able to think in systems. But what is required? The business model needs to change. We're going to suck $20 billion out of the pockets of Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark, period. And if we're not willing to do that, and if we don't have the warriors to do it, we're not going to get the carbon in our soil. It doesn't make any sense. And we're continuing to put acrylic into our water systems and our ecosystems, which is madness. But it's so comfortable to leave the baby, right, for three, four, five, six hours in this diaper, that because the bum is now not getting cold anymore, because when the baby gets up, it is dry. It thinks it's dry. Everything is absorbed by these chemicals. But therefore, the baby is not learning how to be dry and clean. Ladies and gentlemen, we connect all of these elements that I just mentioned here into mathematical models. It's a system. It's, it's feedback loops. It's multiplier effects. It's all what you know. But it allows us to go to a policymaker and say, guess what? We can take 5% out of your landfill now and replenish your soil and have free fruits. And in 25 years, you have the generation, not the millenniums, you have the generation of the free fruit babies. And scrap the craft with the baby food that has been made so-called organic. In America, even when you call it organic, it is not organic. We have to change the system. Now, we change the system in the practice, we take a symbolic product, we look at the complete impact, and we turn into something that has a better cash flow and a better impact for community than the business model of today with a diaper, Procter & Gamble. 90, sorry, 60% of all diapers in the world today are produced in Indonesia. Let's not talk about transport issues. The key thing is that many people believe there is no money to do this. I mean, one of the biggest problems I have with you, my dear friends in America, is that you believe that you first write a business plan and you first look for the money and then you do something. I've never seen such a stupidity. Why don't you do? And while you're doing, money will flow to you automatically. I mean, this is turning things around. We never were first looking for money and writing business plans and then doing. We were always doing because when there was a responsible need of people to do something for their community and society, they got them to sit together and say, let's write a business plan. So here is what we've done in a small island called El Hierro in Spain. Anyone from Spain here? We're now going to the Canary Islands. This is the last island where Christopher Columbus left Europe. From there, he went to the Americas. This is a beautiful island that has a few very simple problems. It has no water and it has really no electricity. So we designed a program that costs $90 million to make the island self-sufficient in water and power, and there are 10,000 people on the island. What do you think about this crazy idea? You see, most people immediately tell me, you're nuts, 90 million people for 10,000. Well, that is what you think is nuts. What is really nuts is that these people spend $10 million a year on f import fuel to run the generators to have some water and some power. And if I propose a 40-year capital expenditure of 90 million, with only 10 years it's paid off. Ladies and gentlemen, return on investment, 25%. Ha! Cash available. Collateralize what you're spending on petroleum anyway. You collateralize that and you fund it. And then you have 30 years free water and free power. So who's crazy? The we are crazy, the ones who believe that there is no money and petroleum import is the normal thing to do. And we prove that this community is going to change completely. And we have implemented that. We have the water, we have the energy, we generated the jobs. And we eliminated the subsidies. You know, when you do a financial systemic approach to this, if you do a typical Excel spreadsheet, then you realize that this is not fundable with present banking systems. Not fundable. But if you use a systemic approach, you realize that this is a gold mine. 
And the gold mine is that this island today has a 11.5 megawatt wind park. First of all, what we did is we merged the power company with the water company. This is policy. When we merge them, we are able to align the interests because normally if I'm the power company and I know you need water, you're never going to get cheap power. <laughs> if I align them, you get first electricity into the grid, second, we're pumping water up, third, whatever is left over at marginal cost is to take care of the water. Water at half a cent kilowatt hour. Are we in business for water? What happens if we double the amount of water? Well, we have doubled the amount of water. We have produced this. And we are now pumping $3 million cash into the, into the budget of the local city because we're managing it on our own. Instead of paying off some people some far away, it's going into the local economy. So on the 10 million that was used to export import of petroleum and export your money, now 3 million is pure profit by supplying water at half the cost. So we're going for the next phase. And we're going for the phase and we're saying we're going to invest $140 million for 6,000 electric vehicles plus its infrastructure. And what is people's response to that? You're crazy. 6,000 vehicles, 140 million? No, we're not crazy because they're at the moment spending 10 million a year on imported fuel. And we've redesigned the business model so that we can have a new thinking for electric vehicles. The battery of the electric vehicle is controlled by the water and power company. We don't sell a car with a battery. The car is leased without a battery. Guess what's happening to the price of the car? And then the power and water company does smart grid management with 6,000 batteries, earning 200 euro, $200 per battery per month. What's the cost of getting these cars? For free. This is embarrassing. So we go back to our systemic analysis because Excel spreadsheets say this is not possible. Systemic analysis says it's a gold mine. It's a gold mine and what we've done, we have succeeded now in the island 21 years after we started. It takes a little generation, right? After 21 years, we have double the amount of water at half the price. The island is only renewable energy. New farms are being established and they only have a license to establish a new farm if they're organic. European standard of organic, not American standard. We have small scale industries popping up like yogurt manufacturing, fresh fruit manufacturing, processing, meat processing, wine production, everything related to agriculture. Everything is processed locally. And the farmer gets 10% of the final price of a processed product. Let me explain to you. Normally when you get milk from your cow or your goat and you sell it, the price in the market would be barely 30 cents a liter. We're paying 2.4 euro per liter, eight times more. Why? Because we share 10% of the price we get for the final organic yogurt with fresh cut fruits, and 10% of that goes to the farmer, and that is 2.4 euro. You know, these goats, they get a kiss before they go to bed. I mean, people love these goats. So we have a different relation with the animal because it's not about how do I feed the animal to such an extent that it starts producing more milk. It is loving the animal because the business model has changed. And when we see in this business model, we do a transformation of the economy and we steer business towards sustainability. You know, this is in the end what we're in need of. And let me take you now to Mongolia. When we're in Mongolia and we look at this picture, which is not my picture, this is the official picture from the tourism organization of Mongolia. These are the wonderful goats that give you cashmere. Who is ready to admit you have cashmere at home? I'm going to pick on you because you're responsible for destroying the Gobi Desert. The way we are processing cashmere and the way Macy's and others is offering cashmere sweaters at $49.99 is just insane because there is a second problem if you are buying a cashmere sweater over the internet 
and pay over the internet, then our dear friends from PayPal earn more money than the shepherd who herded the goats during minus 35 in the winter for three months in a row. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is absurd. I have nothing against PayPal. But it's absurd that we have a business model whereby the herder, the shepherd, gets less than PayPal. I mean, let's wake up. This is, I love the quote that you put on there, fact ignorant species of human beings. I mean, everything is supposed to be on the internet, but how come we miss that one? And we have an increased demand because a sweater from Kashmir that used to be one and a half kilograms 50 years ago, today is only 150 grams because we want to sell Kashmir, the notion, and therefore we're destroying. I'm not going to go into detail of this. You can find it on our web and I'm sharing this presentation with you but you have a vicious circle that leads to the destruction of 5,000 years of Kashmir and goat culture around the Gobi. That's what we're doing. And in 20 years, ladies and gentlemen, there's gonna be nothing left. That is my picture from three months ago. That is my picture. On Chinese size and Mongolian size, exactly the same. Complete desertification. And what we're needing to ask ourselves is again, how can we save the shepherd? What can we do? And it all comes back to the same simple principle. We have now a deal with Sibila Sordono, who is a great designer from Spain, and we're going to launch the Kashmir. We have our first two tons with 300 families organized, and we're going to do a Kashmir that's only sold direct. And I'm sorry, we're doing exactly the same business model as you do with your marijuana and your cannabis, cash only. We are doing cash only, and it's only in pop-up stores, but we're getting 10% to the shepherd. He's getting now 12 times more. You know what it means, 12 times more? That means he immediately wants to have a third of the goats, still earning four times. Gobi Desert saved. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not difficult. But if you start looking at the mathematical models behind it that allows us to say, what would the price be? Then we see a complete different solution. You can't do it in Excel spreadsheets. Ladies and gentlemen, in my organization, the use of Excel spreadsheets is forbidden. We ban it. If you come up with an Excel spreadsheet, you're out for the day. And then you're asked to reflect. Let me take you to India. And I take this case especially because you have this joint program with India. And here I'm looking at tea. I was asked to look at tea after a visit to the Kaziranga National Park in India. Who's been to Kaziranga National Park? The greatest park in the world for wild elephants, wild Asian elephants, you have wild rhinos, wild tigers, and next to it, you have an organic plantation, tea plantation. Mr. Ratan Tata himself decided eight years ago to go organic. But if you go organic and you don't have carbon in your soil, your production drops 75%. Then Mr. Tata becomes honorary chairman, and then he has a very brilliant person, trained by McKinsey, to be in charge and put some, some logic in the business. His first logic, of course, is that since the tea production dropped 75%, and the tea harvest is only limited to seven months, five months, everyone is on temporary contract. What happens if you have 2,000 people on temporary contract on one side, and on the other side of the street, you get rhinos, tigers, and elephants? How do you call that? Poaching. So do we need to be system thinkers? No, this is a very simple cause and effect. So what we were asked by the, by the Tata group, do you have a business model for this? A business model that eliminates poaching? And we're saying, well, if this is what you got, and in Assam, in the northeast of India, when you have a tea plantation, you provide canopy shades. It's not like Dar Darjeeling. And so I look at these trees and said, let's put up some pepper vines. I mean, India is pepper, right? So the whole plantation has become a pepper vine plantation. Now, try to get into the mindset of these Tata guys that they are in the pepper business as well as the tea business. No, 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 they're the tea business. No, no, your tea and pepper business. We increased turnover 20% by just putting vines around the trees. Do you need a PhD for that? 
I mean, this is common sense. And then there are the prunings, because you need to clip the bushes of tree, and the volume of clippings you have is four times the volume of your tea leaves. And what do we do with that? Well, we form mushrooms on that. So now you're a tea plantation with mushrooms and pepper. And what do you need? You need to dry it. And since you have 75% less tea leaves, you have 75% excess capacity for drying. We put all of that in system models. When people tell me we do not know how to do mushrooms, I show them these pictures of my sons, my son of, at the age of three who knows how to farm mushrooms. My son can do it at the age of three. You all can do it. It's just a matter of learning how to do it. And we're launching the Hatikuli tea. Value generation of this organic tea is 21 times more than in the supply chain management logic of the Tata Group, which is the second largest in the world for tea. How come we can be so innovative? Because we're systems thinkers. We're systems doers. We employ 2,000 people, and by generating 2,000 additional jobs, no more poaching. We have applied for the, the Buckminster Fuller Prize this year with this model. We're in the semifinals. I hope you help us to get it because I'm going to lock in Tata to do it when we get the award. We need to think differently about every single commodity that we have around. This is coffee. You know, we're only consuming 0.2% of the coffee. 99.8% is wasted. A 10 million ton business is only valued for 20,000 tons that gets ingested. My daughter Chido, who's here teaching women, in Zimbabwe, that with the waste of the coffee, they can have self-sufficiency in food and food security. These women, they get up, they sing, they dance, and they do it. What do they want in the West? Business plans. We have 3,000 farms around the world now. And people say, isn't this great? And I say, no, we should have 25 million. We could turn 10 million tons of coffee in 25 million tons of feed and food. That is only possible if you change the business model. So now we have coffee in Patagonia clothing. We have it in interface carpets. We have it in insulation for refrigerators. We have a UV protector put into paint that is coffee. And now we have batteries that store hydrogen and methane in ground up coffee after you had your espresso. Ladies and gentlemen, if you model this, what is the impact of 10 million when you do this? You're realizing you're growing the economy with factor 500. We don't think this is possible, but we can. Because if we get the focus from resource efficiency to value added generation and get out of the model of our core business core competence, then we will be able to do it. I need to add this example, and I'm going to beg you, I'm going to give two more examples. One is the paper chemistry. You know, this is the horror of gold mines. You Coloradoans, you still have gold mines, and you still do this. You still use cyanide. You still have tailing dams. You still have the dust blowing around. You still ensure that there is asthma for decades to come. I mean, nice, huh? And they have a license to operate. You, at least those of you who are in America, you gave them the license to operate. And so what we have decided to, 17 years ago is to start focusing on creating stone paper out of rock dust. 80% rock dust blended with 20% recycled HDPE, high-density polyethylene, which is what you have in your Tetra packs, is combined. There is the first factory. We don't cut a tree to have paper. We don't use a drop of water. And it's recyclable forever. Nice. Who doesn't like it? Well, those who have invested in trees, GMO trees that cover the world with hundreds of millions of hectares. They don't like it. They block it. But hey, I'm lucky. I work with the Chinese government. And we're not undercover. We're open source. Four factories built in four years' time. Chinese government will go to 25 million tons of stone paper per year in 10 years. No water, no trees cutting, recyclable forever. Do we realize what it is? If you make an Excel spreadsheet, then you could see there's an ROI of 30%. But if you make a system dynamics analysis, you're realizing you're transforming food for the world. 
you're transforming efficiency, and you're taking care of the errors of the past. This is what system dynamics teaches you to do. You can correct the errors of the past. With just with the 678,000 tons today in China, 40 million tons of water are saved, and we cut energy consumption by 67%. I mean, this is the kind of things we need to do. Who's happy with minus 10%? We're not going to turn this world sustainable if we do minus 10%. We've got to radically change the logic. And so people say, but isn't cellulose lighter than the rocks? Sure. So we have our research team working on it, and we found a solution. We blend our paper with air. You heard it? We take rocks, we take polymers, recycled, and we pump in micro-air bubbles. What's the cost of air? Nothing. How competitive is this paper? Well, if you have reasonably clean air, if it's very dirty air, you've got to clean it up. But. So we're blending this. And so what we've succeeded is we've really continued to change the logic around commodity after commodity. I've talked to you about tea, about paper, about mining, about rocks. We talk about all these simple products. And here comes perhaps the biggest surprise. You know this flower? You have more around. It's called a thistle. Cardoon, say the English. Well, what do you do with that? Well, in this country, you kill it. You're out to murder this with uh, glyphosates and what Roundup and you name it. You want to get rid of it. Now, have you realized that even if you pour chemicals in it every year, it doesn't go away? Have you realized this is a perennial? Have you realized this is a perennial with lateral roots that just is not killed unless you turn everything around? So, let's live with it. We have converted the first chemical factory in the world, the largest biorefinery in the world, is processing thistles. We're processing thistles in polymers, in elastomers, in lubricants, and herbicides, because they're good fighters in their ecospace. They know how to crowd the other ones out. So let's get that chemical out. And our waste is animal feed. And the dust on the flowers are bacterial enzymes, which we use for goat cheese. Would you like to put it on a system dynamics model and then see how the territory of Sardinia is changing its economy because you're using the thistles that are available at what cost? What's the cost of harvesting a thistle? The cost of harvesting. No planting, no fertilizer, no seed business. Of course, this is going to be opposed and going to be out loud in America, but we're working in other parts of the world. We're moving. And we're doing the fistful processing of the biorefinery in the old petrochemical facility of ENI. The first petrochemical cracker of Europe is going to be, is confer, it was going to be, is now confer, con, uh, converted into a biorefinery. We're using stranded assets. Now, this is the only way I can make this clear to Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, to the investors, is through a systems model. It's the only way. And the numbers are so mind-boggling that we raise $540 million for this project in three weeks' time, <laughs> thanks to systems modeling. Isn't it time you start teaching MBAs? Why are you sitting in mathematics, all us, in classrooms? got to get out of there. This is the factory. In the meantime, we've done it six times. This is not once. We've done it six times. Only in Italy. Because I'm out to transform the economy of Italy. I don't want to change the world. Let's start with Italy. Italy will be the first country in the world that will have eliminated all petroleum crackers in its economy. And it's generating more value. More added value, more jobs. Now, this is what we can prove and demonstrate. And this is our hero. Of course, it's a lady. I mean, how could you ever expect a man to be able to do that? You will never see her in the media. She's focused on doing it. She's not like Paul Paulson of Unilever, who likes to be in the media all the time. We teach, actually, system dynamics for transforming business models on the projects where we have done it. So El Hierro is our next base, where we've done the island project. On the island project, we spend 10 days to start simulating the mathematical modeling behind it that allows us to then take on another 100 islands. And this is the reason why we've been rather successful with our blue economy. 
We've mobilized $4 billion in the past six years for the financing of 200 projects. It's amazing. I could never have imagined, ever, to have that kind of a pull on the market. Never. It's, it's insane. But the people are sick and tired. They're desperate. And either you vote for <clears throat> Trump or you get into system dynamics. I wrote a report to the Club of Rome in 2009 outlining the basic ideas. But the heart and the soul of these ideas were summarized 20 years in a little book called Upsizing. Anyone who wants it, it's here. You can have it. I and mean, what we need to do is to realize that these ideas are based on ethics. Ethics. And that's why I so much appreciate on Wednesday you have your interfaith meeting. But never think that I'm the one doing all of this. Please, don't. I have an incredible network of mentors who have been extremely instrumental in getting me to think and focus on the implementation. Because what we're missing most in the world are the implementers, not entrepreneurs who want to become billionaires. You recognize anyone there? Good. So do I. Special mention, I think, today for Elie Wiesel, who is probably the person who really helped me put ethics at the core, who passed away a couple of weeks ago, days before we were to meet. If we only teach our children to conclude what we know, our children will never be able to do better than we do. This has to be our logic. We have to create a degree of freedom to think so far out of the box and that thinking out of the box could start with a little elephant. I mean, do you know that baby elephants change their teeth, including the little tusks, five times? I don't understand why do you want to kill a bull when the little the baby tusks just drop on the ground five times. How come we don't know this? How come we don't set up a little fund so that the, the kids in Africa could go and pick up the little tusks? Wouldn't that be a bit more sensible than trying to mobilize police and the Mossad in order to stop the poaching and the illegal trade within China? So I published this book, The Tusk Fairy in China. Kids have a tooth fairy, elephants have the right to a tusk fairy. And the promoter of that is no one less than Yao Ming. You remember Yao Ming from MBA? So Yao Ming is our promoter. He's presenting the fable on the Shanghai International Book Fair. We need to be able to put in the system communications in a way that we touch people's hearts. Too much mathematics doesn't touch the heart. The heart and the soul needs to be inspired, and that's what we're missing. I have 220 fables written, 108 are published in China, distributed to children in China by the government, and I don't know why I have that privilege. But what is clear that the Chinese government is ready for systems thinking like no one else, but put it in practice. We're doing with the Chinese government stone paper systematics, the system dynamics of stone paper. I tell you, the minister decides in 30 minutes that's what we're going to do, based on systems models. Government policy making, I'm so happy to see it in your agenda. Policy making is key. And you have a tool that Jay Forrester was the one who introduced me to it. I was exposed to this for the first time when I was a student at university, and Jay Forrester was to me an incredible inspiration. And I studied the system dynamics. Final words. If you're not inspiring the next generation, you better focus on Excel spreadsheets. With the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you.